Hey, welcome. We're glad you're here. Take two. Thanks for being a part of worship at First Baptist Church Allen. We are in Joshua. Open your Bibles. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Look at you learning the books of the Bible. Joshua. And we're going to look at the first chapter, one of the great passages in the Bible. And we're talking about fear. Facing our fears. It's not, fear is not just something that you run from, not something that you hide away, not something that you just carry as a burden. It's something that you face. And through uh, the power of our God, you can overcome. Now, there... Fear is the reality of life, and there's some fears that are actually helpful fears. Fears is what, fear is what keeps a child from touching a hot stove. Fear is uh, what keeps you from driving recklessly. Fear that you'll be pulled over. Fear that you'll be in trouble with the law. And truthfully, fear is what keeps me from dressing the way I'd really like to. You know, big, bold stripes and polka dots and just expressing my true personality. It's fear of what my wife and children will say. And that, that really keeps me in check in what I, what I wear. Nine out of ten people say they are terrified of speaking in front of groups of people. Another major fear are insects uh, in, in the multiple varieties that God has created them. Uh, Don and I got into a conversation about this because we both had the experience of... Uh, Walking out in the dark, my car, because of having a rental car, because my car has had some hail damage getting fixed, and so I've been in this rental, and going out in the dark, and just walking up to the car, and suddenly, you're just covered in a spider web, and it's the, I'm in the dark, and no one's here with me, and I'm pretty sure there's a spider in that web somewhere, and you just, you start scrambling, fear of insects. Some people are afraid of speaking in front of large groups of insects, because it just stands to reason that would be an even greater fear, right? Others, heights, deep water, uh, financial problems, aging, loneliness. Carol Klein was conducting a study, and this is reported in the New York Times. She says that humans are only born with two fears, fear of heights and fear of noises. But it doesn't take long until children start to develop a whole set of other fears. So in her research, she found this, 81% are scared of dying. 75% are afraid of animals. 73% are afraid of the house burning down or being followed by strangers. 70% frightened of being kidnapped. Adults in her study listed their fears, fear of physical attack, uh, fear of the, just the, the random shooting, fear of job loss, broken marriage, personal failure, loss of faith, what others will think about them, financial loss, children's future, death, growing old, and that was her list. I just added this one. Anything that says some assembly required just undoes me in many ways. Fears can unnerve us. It causes ulcers, cause all kinds of physical problems tied to our fears when they come to capture us. And uh, it can destroy a marriage, a career, a business, a church. Much of the advertising world, you know this, is wrapped around your fears. Because they say, here's the solution for your fears. Here's how to make you feel better about what you're afraid of. So, Fear. It is everywhere and all the time. I went looking uh, for stories about fear, and I came across this, uh, this little article, and it describes famous people from history and the things that they're afraid of. Now, here's the deal. I tell you my fears, and you say, that's ridiculous. Why would anybody be afraid of that? If you tell me your fears, I'd probably say the same thing to you. That's ridiculous. Why would anybody be worried about that? So here's some. Julius Caesar great military leader, uh, emperor of Rome, he was terrified, undone by thunder. A thunderstorm paralyzed him uh, with fear. Peter the Great was the Tsar of Russia. If you've done any reading about that time period, Peter the Great, he's an imposing guy, he's six five, bigger than everybody else, meaner than anybody that's ever come along. The things he accomplished and all that, but he had a fear. And uh, history reveals he was afraid of bridges, of crossing a bridge. Now, we have a family friend that has uh, some of this. It says he crossed them only when there was no other alternative. And as he crossed the bridge, he trembled and cried convulsively until he got across the bridge. Peter the Great. 18th century British writer, literary critic, uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson uh, and 
Johnson wrote about all sorts of stuff, had opinions about everything. But he had this phobia, and the phobia was about entering rooms. And his thing was, if he walked up and he entered a room with his left foot first, and he, he would always realize it, he would back out, go backwards, and come back so that he would always enter the room with his right foot. And he, it undid him. If he realized it along the way, he would leave the room and do it again. Like, you know, taking the, put your best foot forward to an extreme. He was all about the right foot had to come in the room first. Our fears do strange things to us. If uh, you come upon a group of people, group of friends, and they're gossiping about something, our fear of not fitting in, not being a part of the group, can lead us to, to join in instead of maybe backing away from, from such things. We get pulled into things by our fears. A fear of consequences may lead us, <clears throat> knowing we're guilty, may lead us to lie about what we've done to avoid consequence. A fear of being alone may lead us to, to enter into a relationship, to make a decision about uh, the people we're spending time with that, that, that truthfully we, we would never make if we weren't fearing that we're not going to be in with the in crowd, we're not going to be with other people, we fear of loneliness. If you look at a lot of things that are sin in our lives, you'll often find fear driving things. And here's the, here's the thing, God knows our fears and that's why, in all the different, uh, the different ways it shows up, that, that little phrase, some fear not, do not be afraid, there are different ways it's said, but by one count, there are 365 times in the Bible. And if you read through the whole Bible, you're going to find it, Old Testament, New Testament, over and over again. Don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Fear not. 365 times, one for every day of the year, because God knows we're a fearful people. Now, God cares about our fears. Uh, maybe the most familiar verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. I'm going to do this. I'm going to use a different translation just because it, you catch it differently. You hear it differently than the routine of hearing it. John 3, 16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And the Bible says this. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear god loves us perfectly oh i try to we try to love our our spouses love our kids love our family love our friends but god loves us to perfection he demonstrated that through jesus christ and by faith in him who loved us so much his perfect love casts out our fear one of the greatest dangers of our fears i think is that they'll paralyze us from usefulness in God's work. You know, fears are what holds you back from following God, from being faithful to God, from moving forward with God. And it's all those different reasons, it's just fear of missing out. Fear, fear that uh, we're going to have to do something that makes us uncomfortable. Uh, all, all of those things are wrapped up in our fears. That was the case with the children of Israel on the edge of the promised land, having wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, seeing so much consequence of sin and failure, and now they're about to enter a whole new dimension of experiencing God and seeing Him at work. And there was fear in the camp because, because God's Word tells us there must have been because of the message that they kept getting from the Lord. Do not be afraid. Now, we don't want to be weak and vulnerable and indecisive, ineffective as servants of the Lord, but fear is going to do all that to us. It will wreck us for usefulness in God's kingdom. Fear will keep you from being what God wants you to be. From their example, we're going to draw some things today about the fears we face and how to face our fears. I don't know what you have marked in your Old Testament, and I'm encouraging in this each week, but when you get to Joshua, there's lots of good stuff, and a lot of people know Joshua 24 you know, choose, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a great, a great spot. But this first, first chapter of Joshua is such a good place to have marked, a good place to revisit on a regular basis, and especially when you, you encounter difficulty and hardship, when, when life is challenging and the questions are many. And this is what God's Word says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses... The Lord's servant, 
What a great way to be remembered in the Word of God. The Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. In that verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. That was not news, but you need to be reminded of it. it Moses isn't going to be here anymore. This is on you now, Joshua. You're, you're my chosen leader for these people. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I'm giving the Israelites. I've given you every place where the sole of your foot treads. What's going to happen? That's the same kind of promise he gave to Abraham. And Abraham went from top to bottom in the country, walking that land. These, these Israelites, as they conquer the land of promise, they're going to go north to south, east to west, and uh, they're, they're, they're going to lay claim to God's promise. Just as, as your foot treads, just as the Lord promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness of Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates River, all the land of the Hittites, and west of the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous. For you will distribute the land I swore to your fathers to give them as an inheritance. Above all, be strong and courageous to observe carefully the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from the right or the left so that you will have success wherever you go. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You're to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you'll prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. You know, after this many times, you start feeling a little paranoid about it, don't you? You see, this is an issue for the people. It's an issue for Joshua. Fear. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that's just a good word from God's word for us on any given day. Now, a few things we want to touch on. We gave you a little bit of an outline your program today to make note of this because it's worth the reflecting on, I think, in the days ahead. When we think about our fears, and we see this in the example of these folks, there's a fear of this responsibility. Here's how this goes. There's a personal dynamic going on in Joshua's life. He stands on the edge of the promised land. Think, think of this. How would you feel if you say, okay, the guy, I'm following Moses. That the word of God itself declared is irreplaceable. You don't want to follow that guy. You want to follow the guy that didn't know what he was doing. If you, many of you have been in a workplace where you say, well, the guy before me, he left, he left a mess. Everything I do is going to be positive. Everything I do is going to be up and to the right based on the person I'm following. He's following Moses. The Bible says of him, God's word, no prophet has arisen again in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And Joshua is like, hey, man, I'm standing right here. I'm, I'm his right-hand man, and I'm, I'm never going to be Moses is what God's word just said to me that's a tough uh, a tough role he's been the assistant now he's stepping up to take the lead role and joshua was certainly recognized but now he is recognizing that this is not an honorary position he is taking on a huge responsibility responsibility is uh what leadership is and there's a lot written about leadership leadership is not just someone that has a certain title that they aspire to or uh, whatever it says on your door, or your desk, uh, your business cards. Uh, leadership is not uh, positional leadership. Leadership is just influencing other people. And every, you say, well, I'm not really a leader. I'm just little old me. Well, everybody's a leader because somebody's watching you. Somebody's moving because of you. Somebody, somebody's following your example. And if it's just at your house, you're a leader. If, if it's your friends, it's, it, you're, you're a leader. You're influencing others all the time. And we just want to do this really well. And we don't want to retreat from the opportunity that God presents to us. By the way, responsibility serves up fear because we come up with all the excuses of why it won't work, right? Why I'm the wrong guy for the job. And just know that in the things that God calls us to and the things the Bible declares is the commands of God, the guidance of God, the wisdom of God that we're, we're to obey, we're to, we're to line up with. If you're afraid to do the things that God's word says, just know that fear did not come from God. That, that is, and we'll, we'll hit on that again. But I just want to say it up front and early. Your fear is not from God. 
How about this? I love calling that our men. Men, take responsibility for your family, for your marriage, for your kids. Don't delegate that some, something as precious as that to, to somebody else or just mail it in or just assume it's going to happen uh, somewhere else. <laughs> in family leadership, you, men, are you going to do it the right way? Well, not all the time. You going to make mistakes along the way? Absolutely. Are you qualified based on your experience and your past record to do this well? No, probably not. However, there just comes a day when you say, I'm going to do my best before God with his help and with his wisdom. I'm going to lead my family. Parents, it's always going to be easier to delegate raising your kids to the school and the church. And you just manage their schedules. But in, in spiritual development, there's so many different things that you can do with your children. Uh, but their eternal souls are in the balance here. Don't let everybody else control what's happening with your kids and what they're going to do with their day and how, they're, how their life is going to be managed. As parents, guide them in the fear and instruction of the Lord. Christian citizen, have you given up on your country? Is it a mess? Yes, as a matter of fact. I checked in this morning on the news. Still a mess today. Do you think that the way to get America back to the way it ought to be is to electing the right people to office? Don't give up your vote. Be informed. Be diligent. Vote well at all levels. By the way, for most Christian citizens, I would mention this. Presidential elections are not the only time we vote on stuff in America. In fact, that's kind of rare. However, most Christian citizens aren't voting on the things that are going to affect day-to-day -day life like local elections. You might want to tune into that one, right? But here's the thing. For about the last 50 years, there have been a lot of Christians who have believed that they could vote America to love Jesus. And that's just not how the Bible tells, us, tells it happens. You know how you make your nation a nation that loves Jesus? You go tell people about Jesus. You can't vote and ask people who don't know Jesus to pretend like they do. And to act like a Christian when they're not a Christian. What the world needs more than anything else is they need somebody to tell them about the Savior. Lost people need to be saved. And that's what changes a nation. Church leader, and my goodness, you're influencing people at a lot of different levels, a lot of different places. One at a time. Or maybe you're over a group. Maybe you're over some area of ministry. Take responsibility. Don't, and for all, don't just sit back. Don't just be a consumer of religious services. God has something for everybody to get into the game and to make a difference, to move the ball down the field. And the things that are priority in God's economy just have to have a priority over every other activity in your life. But it seems like we say, well, this God stuff, that's the one that's negotiable. That's, that's where our margin is, is God. And, and God's plan for the world and his, through his church, through his mission. That, that's, the, that's the sidebar. And everything else, if you need some margin, just peel it off of the God stuff. If it's a busy day, peel it off of your time with God reading your Bible and your prayer. It, it, peel it off of Sunday. Peel it off of Wednesday. Peel it off of, uh, of your small group during the week. It, it's, and it just cannot be so in this generation. And we have to decide, do we really believe this or are we just playing a game? Is this the truth of God or is it not? Fear would have kept Joshua in the shadows always and all these big things. So step up to faith and experience God. And like Joshua, you step out and you get in the game. You might discover God's a pretty awesome God. And, and, and you get to see him up close and you get to see him in his power. So let's, let's just get up and let's go. Not be afraid of taking things on. There's a fear of failure, I think. And that's what also paralyzes us in this, this whole thing of following the Lord. Joshua had this great challenge before him. All kinds of self-doubt haunts most of us. And he had to wonder, you know, am I going to blow this uh, somehow? Am I going to make the wrong choices? Are we going to enter the promised land and they're going to kick us right back across the Jordan River again? The fear of failure will hold us back from even trying to move forward in life, though. And we just become paralyzed by our fears. Overcoming the fear of failure when you're trying to serve God, comes through one place, through faith. Now, let's see. How do we please God? Well, by faith. 
Because without faith, it's what? How? It's, it, it's impossible to please God? How many of you remember that? In the first hour, nobody did. So we're going to go back and do the Abraham sermon for them next Sunday. Without faith, it's not just improbable to please God, difficult to please God. It's impossible to please God. Think about it. When was the last time you took a step of faith? Something that was beyond just what you could do anyway. Something that was different than just following the path that was already set in front of you, uh, just bumping along. When was the last time you did something that made you uncomfortable, that, that required you to trust God for something? When did that happen? Or has it ever happened? Have you ever pleased God in your whole life? To get beyond yourself and beyond what was comfortable and convenient and easy and, and where the road was going anyway. Uh, you know, Jesus talked about a broad way and a narrow way. And he said, anybody can run down the broad way. The narrow way, that's the one that leads to life. And few are those who find it. The broad way, it's an express way. That's the easy way. And a lot of people who say they love Jesus are just on the broad way. And that is not what God sent Jesus to die on the cross for you to live. Now, do you know the difference? Do you know the difference between fact and faith? Between fact and faith. This is my illustration. Fact is that I'm standing up here behind this podium talking to you about Joshua. This is what faith is. Faith is is that somehow I believe that some of you are listening to it. That's what faith is. That somebody is hearing something out there. Now, I have also sat in crowds, and I have listened to other people talk, and I know how listening goes. Because as soon as you say, you got to do this, this is what God's calls to, this is where the road goes, if you're following after the Savior, then what happens? You say, well, I want to justify that, rationalize that, dial that back, tell you all the reasons why that's not so. Faith for me is just believing maybe somebody will take a step today beyond where they've been. That uh, fact and faith thing, I think about Joshua. I think this is exactly what he would had to be feeling. Think about the people he's traveling with. Verse 17 is one of the creepiest verses in the Bible, I think. Here's, uh, here's what it says. They were, they're giving this great pledge to Joshua. Okay, Joshua, you're the leader now. Moses is dead. You're our guy. And they say... He's challenged them already. We're going. And they said, we will be with you just as we obeyed Moses and everything. Certainly the Lord your God will be with you as he was with Moses. And just kind of think Joshua thought, well, I was hoping for better than that. You guys were jerks to Moses his whole time he was with you. you. You didn't do half of what he said, and you wanted to kill him the other half of the time. You complained about everything that happened. You're going to be with me as you were with Moses? That's rotten. You guys are a bunch of nuts. Less than reassuring. Joshua had to fear failure based upon, <laughs> based upon the people, based upon what he had seen uh, in a higher level of leadership among God's people. And here he was at this strategic time, the history of the revelation of God. He has a fear of failure, and it could become paralyzing. That's the fear that keeps a lot of people out of ministry, out of service, out of gospel sharing out of all the it keeps you from obeying and serving god is fear makes i'm uncomfortable it's difficult i'm not sure and when we hold back we ought to be pressing forward this week in your reading you're going to come across a guy named gideon he's one of the after joshua comes the book of judges and it's a it's a roller coaster ride in judges and i read judges this last week in my bible reading and i got to gideon now gideon He's, a, he's an interesting character. He wrote the Old Testament eventually, but here's what happens. His people are being oppressed by the people of Midian, the Midianites. And they're, they're just real jerks. They, they keep coming in. They'll steal their, they wait till it's harvest time. They steal the food from the people of Israel. They, they steal their cattle. They steal their sheep. They're, they're, people are starving to death because of what the people of Midian are doing. And, it says they cry out to the Lord, and the Lord answered, and here's how he answered. He went and found this guy, Gideon. The angel of the Lord appears to Gideon, and what does Gideon say? Well, I heard all these stories growing up about the miracles that God did, but I'm sure not seeing any of them. What's the deal with that? When are you going to do something to help us out? And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have. 
with what you got, everything is there that needs to be there. Deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I'm sending you. Man, that'll fix your wagon, right? How many of you are complaining to God about the way things are? And God says, well, I'll tell you what. You know what my answer is to all your troubles? You. Well, uh, you know, think about me, God, says Gideon, is that I'm just a, I'm just a simple country boy, and I'm just trying, you know, I'm not, I'm, that's not really, I'm not really up to that. That's a little outside of my pay grade. I'm the wrong man for the job. But God didn't give up on Gideon, and Gideon took a step of faith, and God did a great thing through his life. He became one of the great heroes of God's people. Think about it. what's standing between you and, and just serving the Lord, just stepping forward, stepping out. Because God doesn't want to give up on you any more than he wanted to give up on Gideon. There's a fear of rejection. That's the third thing that can paralyze us. I think about Joshua. He's standing on the edge of the land of promise. And he could be fairly sure of the odds. There's about a 50% chance they would follow him and about a 50% chance they would stone him to death. They weren't the most faithful of people. And we are often fearful about the threat of other people rejecting us, just not being in with the in crowd. People thinking that we're weird or out of, uh, out of bounds or not one of us. And we call it, we talk about it with kids often, with peer pressure. But peer pressure is real for senior adults too and everybody in between. We just like to blend in with the crowd most of the time, even if the crowd is going away from God. We, we call it peer pressure, wanting to fit in. Uh... We call it the herd instinct. We call it just wanting to get along, the fear of missing out. But whatever the label, we're fearful of taking a stand and stepping out alone. I read this uh, story and saw a visual of it. It's a, it's a beautiful tapestry in uh, you know, fabric woven, wall hanging uh, in a facility in Germany for recovering alcoholics. And the picture is of this uh, beautiful stream, and in the beautiful stream are, is a school of fish all swimming in close formation, and there's one fish swimming in the opposite direction. And uh, they use it as part of their regular reminders. And the words woven into the tapestry, any dead fish can float downstream. It takes a live one to swim against it. Are you afraid of what people will say or what they will think if you really live the Christian life? Like, well, some of my friends might not like me anymore. Uh, people, people like the, the fun side of me, and I might not be that fun person if I was following Jesus the way he has designed this life to be lived and follow, what following him is supposed to look like. You have to trade some habits, trade some, trade some friends. Would your life have to adjust? Is there a fear of rejection somewhere that's keeping you from following the Lord? And does, giving up friends doesn't mean that you never speak to them again, but it means the people you spend most of your time with are going to, not only are you going to maybe influence them, but more likely they're going to influence you. Where, where are the core people you're spending time with? Maybe you need to shift something somewhere. There's a fear of the challenge. A group of university students from Toronto we had gone up to Georgian Bay. It's a bay off of Lake Huron on this fishing trip. And they got a charter. And they're on this boat. And they get out in the water. And they're out for about an hour out into the bay. And a storm came up. And it was like, we're not sure this is going to go well, says the captain. Now, the kids from the university, the, the university students, well, they're just all huh, huh, happy-go-lucky. And they see the captain. He's a stern and you know, looks a little anxious. And. They said, oh, come on, Captain, we're not afraid. And, and his response was, well, you're too dumb to be afraid. You don't know what we're up against. You don't have the information you need to know how afraid you should be. Joshua was not ignorant of what lay ahead. Uh, he was the captain of the boat. He knew. Because you remember, 40 years earlier, he'd gone in. One of the 12 spies, Moses, they, they pulled out these one representative from each of the 12 tribes. They go into the land of promise. God had said, here's what it's going to be like. Go around, see what you see. And they said, they all came back, all 12 of them. Exactly what God said. This is a great land. There's all kinds of great stuff there. It'd be a wonderful place to live. There's just one problem. Great walled cities, 
powerful armies, giants in the land, and 10 of them, of the 12, said, we can't do it. It's more than we can take on. I, God, I appreciate the thought, but you should have thought through the details of this a little better. You're giving us this land. Amazingly, these other people think it's their land, and we don't think we can knock them off of it. Well, Joshua had seen the same things the other 10 did, but he, along with Caleb, tried to convince them. Oh, for the rest of the people. Again, the, the majority said no. The minority report of these two, faith-filled Joshua and Caleb, we can do it with the Lord's help. Not us. God, we can do this. Don't turn back. Don't give up. God has prepared this land for us. And because they rejected the report of those two men, took the negative report, which we love a good negative report. We love being knocked off our feet by a bad uh, what if. The unbelieving generation ends up walking in the wilderness for 40 years until that whole gang who had said, we don't believe the promises of God, until they died off. Only Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land of that generation. Joshua still believed. He believed God could accomplish the work. And now he is there at the edge of the promised land, and he still knows. He sent in two, two guys. They came back and said, oh, yeah, it's a great land. We can do it. But Joshua still knows walled cities are still there, giants in the land, and uh, great enemy armies. It's worth noting, I think, that great challenges do call out our great fears. If you're not doing, taking a great step for God, you're not going to see great challenges to your fear factor. When you have Jesus in your life, you'll often find yourself in over your head. He doesn't really make the road easy for you because he wants to make you more... God wants to make you more like Jesus, so you're going to go down some paths that are going to challenge you, going to rock your boat a little bit, going to require you to step outside your fears, outside your reservations about things, outside of what is simple and easy and convenient, and do some hard things. And if you're not experiencing a little bit of that on a fairly regular basis, based on the authority of God's Word, you're probably not following God. You're following something, but it's not God, because He's going to create faith opportunities opportunities to over and over again all through this book their faith laboratories that God takes his people through when David went out to face Goliath he had fears about it you know, he, he wasn't just well I'm a kid but I can take on a guy that's bigger than a barn and experienced warrior no problem at all for a stepper like me what he did is he he remembered how God had been with him in smaller things. And he knew that same God was going to be with him here. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Confidence because God did it in other things, he could do it again. Now, it's not an accident that four times in chapter 1, the word of the Lord to Joshua is be strong and courageous. And three conditions had to be met by Joshua and the people in the strong and courageous. First thing, verse 8, study the scriptures. Immerse yourself in God's word. Joshua was told, meditate on it day and night. He was to spend time letting it not just be his head knowledge, but it just part of who he was. To soak in and make God's word authority, not just take it under advisement, God's word, but authoritative in his life. If you and I are going to overcome fears, we're going to have to spend time getting to know God. This book is the Word of God. It tells us who God is and how God does things. And the more you get to know God, the more fear passes away and the more confidence you have in the God of this book. Obey God is the second thing. Verse 7, he was to obey God personally, obey God privately, and lead the people to obey God as a people. How about that? If you want to overcome fear, do what God says. This is the part that we don't get. A lot of people love studying the Bible, and they're full of Bible knowledge. We're a knowledge-based people, I think is American, Americanized Christian uh, expression. We're a knowledge-based. We're going to go to another Bible study, another Bible study, another Bible study. But the obedience part just tends to be missing for a lot of people. How about if we actually did what God said to do? 
that we don't just take it as one of our options for life, but what God says is what we do and how we do it. And there's not much room for fear when you know you're in the middle of what God said to do. And many of our fears, I think, come from living with the, with the consequences of the bad choices we've made in the past, not because of the things God's asked us to do, because of the choices we've made, and it makes us timid. Fear reinforces fear. Faith reinforces faith. Third thing, <coughs> remember is the key word. Joshua was to remember who God was and that God was with him. Joshua, I'm asking you to do something big. I'm asking you to take a big faith step and to lead the people to do it too. But here's the rest of the story, Joshua. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. I'm going to be holding your hand like a child crossing the street with mom, a small child crossing the street with mom and daddy. I'm going to be with you and I'm going to help you and you're not going to have to do this by yourself. But I want you to take a step. So you think about this, I think about this, what do you fear today? When we come in, and I know that <coughs> when I ask you, what do you fear? People say, I'm not afraid of anything, but I'm anxious about this, and I'm uh, uncomfortable about this, and I, okay, well, whatever, whatever moniker you want to put on it, you can call it anything you want to, but we're still talking about fears. The things that are burdens, the things that are heavy, the things that seem like insurmountable obstacles, the things that are hard. What do you fear today? You know, I can confess my fears to you. I, I have my, my share of fears. I'm certainly not a fearless individual. I, I've had fears in the last year at multiple levels about things with our family, the extended family. I've had fears about health stuff. Uh, fears, I, I wake uh, Last night, I go to bed. This morning when I wake up, you know, the first thing I do, I just roll my eyes like that to see if my retina is still in place every day. Because it's coming a day when it's going to happen again, and I just need to be ready for it. But I live with a fear about uh, vision. You know, fears about things with different things related to church and work. But here's what I do believe. I believe that God is faithful. I believe God is with me. I believe God loves me. I believe God is for me. And also believe this, the same is true for every one of you. Because the word of God says so. And my challenge to you in the things that are fearful is the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord says, fear not. And let's just see, let's just go with that. And faith a lot and fear less and see what God might do to, uh, to do some miraculous things in our lives.